Greetings, humans. You have entered the command zone. Your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hey, 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 everybody. You're listening to the Command Zone. Welcome back. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Yay. It's funny because as we're doing the music intro, like we're both like dancing, and but nobody can actually hear. see it. Yeah. <laughs> and we can't hear any real music because it's added in after. Right. But I mean, I hear that song constantly in my head now. I don't know about you. I do too, actually. And I was just re-watching the trailer to season three of BJ Desk, and it comes <laughs> in like two-thirds of the way through, and I'm like... He's like, hey, Abby, you know this song? She's like, oh, wait a second. I've heard this before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, little known fact, trailer for VGHS Season 3 is where this song comes from. Yep, and that's our end step, and that's the show. Okay. Uh, so this show is a follow-up of Tuesday's show. It's like a dual thing, because it's a follow-up to the Archetype Tokens episode, mm-hmm. and it's another in our Deck Doctor series. Oh, my gosh. We're just we just. This is a synergistic away. episode. It's a synergistic week. It is just pure value. <laughs> Everything's working very well with each other. But before we get into that pure value, let's get into more value. Uh, what's that noise? Sounds like sounds like a ton of packs. Oh, booster packs. Booster packs, yeah. It's Magic Origins booster packs. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be giving away some stuff right now. I feel like there should be fanfare. <laughs> People march in like... On this week's winner, uh, we're actually just giving a surprise gift giveaway to an iTunes reviewer. Yay! Yay! So, yeah, we're going to do this once in a while. We're just going to, when we feel like it, we're going to pick a random review that somebody's given us on iTunes, and we're just going to give them some booster packs. So this is going to be three packs of Magic Origins, and it's going to go to iTunes reviewer... Dan Glosson. Dan Glosson. Woo! You did it. And Uh, actually, I said randomly, but this one was chosen because Dan wrote an awesome review. (laughs) Yeah. That's pretty great. Uh, You want to read it, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, he gave us a card. It's called Legendary Podcast Dash Jimmy and Josh. We're like P and Kieran Alaris status (laughs) here. Whenever the command zone enters the battlefield, target player listens to and enjoys podcasts until end of turn. Very nice. And it has an activated ability uh, for Wooberg, uh, white, blue, black, red, green. Target podcaster receives a five stars. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. It also has flavor text. <laughs> <laughs> it says, only the first Highlander movie is worth watching. And it's attributed to Jimmy Wong and Josh Lee Kwai. That quote is, I mean. <laughs> I don't remember when we said this. We must have said it. But it is true. Only the first Highlander movie <laughs> is worth watching. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I read it, I was like, did we say that? Well, I agree with it, so we probably did say yeah, it. Yeah, we probably did say yeah. it. Uh, we're also a 5-5, five five, so thank you uh, for making us a beefy, beefy card. Although, I guess we don't know actually how much we cost to cast. I'm assuming... Ooh, cost to cast. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming it's Wooberg, but I have no idea. Yeah, that's true. We don't have a casting cost. Yeah. Um, well, it's free, technically. You guys get to get the show for that's free. That's true. Oh, man, this is a broken card. We just occasionally ask you to like listen to a like a survey or a mid-roll. And then we just give it to us. Super <laughs> occasionally, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dan, email us your mailing address to commandscast at rocketjump.com so we can send you your packs. And everybody else, if you want to have a chance to win packs in the future, go to iTunes, give us a review. Mm-hmm. Uh, make sure to type out a review because otherwise we can't give you prizes. Yeah. And uh, it's better if you just put a few words in. It doesn't need to be an essay or a fake card. Um, no, it doesn't have to be long in any way. Uh, anything you yeah. write that's nice will get you a chance to win stuff. And if it's mean, we'll just be like, why are you being so mean? Probably won't uh, end up giving you packs for that, but yeah. yeah. And we, we do randomly choose stuff, too. Just in this case, it was a very fun uh, fun review. So thanks, Dan. So make sure you email us, commandcast at rocketjump.com. And we have another winner today. Oh, we're giving away two things. I totally forgot. That's right, because we're doing a Deck Doctors. Woohoo! Uh, last week, we did Corona false god uh that was a fun one this week we're actually doing a token deck right yep we're doing rith the awakener Ooh, and the winner is <laughs> kyle rogers, kyle rogers. Beep, beep, beep. so kyle rogers we have chosen your deck to doctor. spotlight and doctor on up and it's a rith the awakeners uh with the awakener deck which we thought was really timely because we just did the Archetype Tokens episode, the Token Talk episode. Um, So 
this will be good because we've just gone through a lot of the philosophies and now we can look at a specific deck. You kind of get two deck doctors in a row because you get to hear about Rith the Awakener uh, multiple times. <laughs> you, it's or just, just tokens in it's general. It's just pure token value. Yeah, tokens which is all the time. as it should be. Uh, it's also a dragon, so totally awesome. Oh, that's a good um, point. So uh, before we get into it, uh, if you guys don't know, we're doing a Deck Doctor series. It's really simple. All you have to do is email us a deck that you put out on tappedout.net to commandcast at rocketjump.com. We're giving away packs of the dark uh, while supplies last. Uh, but we're also just going to keep doing Deck Doctors throughout the history of the show and the future of the show. So if you guys have a, doc a deck that needs doctoring or needs work, you have a specific thing with it that's wrong, send us an email. Let us know what is going on, and uh, we will file it into the giant bank of Deck Doctor submissions, and we may pick here someday, and you'll win free stuff. Do you know who just sent in a submission? Who? Alex... Ma Alexander New M on Twitter, who what? is the guy that gave us the dark packs that we're giving away. He to wants the deck them back. Maybe he's trying to win one. No, he he clearly said, I don't need to win it back, but this is a deck I'm having trouble with. So even he's entering the contest. And oh, thank you, nice. Alex, for yes. providing the packs of the dark that we're giving away. That's right. Alexander Newman. He also writes on MTG Bro Deals, and we've included the link in the show notes if you guys want to check out the articles. He's written a lot of good stuff there. Oh, before we start, I just wanted to give a big shout out to one of our listeners who recently sent me a bunch of really awesome token cards for my Titania deck. Ooh, very nice. Yeah, pretty sweet. They're homemade tokens. Uh, yeah. Printed on really professional cardstock. It's really great, actually. They're, they have uh, Groot on one of them. Yep, they have Groot. They're, they're very cool. And he gave me a lot of them, which shows a lot of confidence in my deck that it's going to create a lot of tokens. So I really actually <laughs> appreciate that. So uh, Dan Locke, who is at... Fubadu on Twitter. Dan, you're awesome. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, man. You are a rock star. <laughs> All right. So let's read Rith the Awakener. Okay. Rith the Awakener is three and three, a red, a green, and a white. So six mana total for a flying 6-6 six, six dragon legend. It says, when Rith the Awakener deals combat damage to a player, you may pay two and a green. If you do, choose a color. Put a 1-1 one, one green sapperling creature token into play for each permanent of that color. Interesting. So it, it it's definitely sort of, I mean, it makes a lot of tokens. It mm -hmm. also builds on itself. So if you hit with him once, then you make a few tokens. And the next time, you're probably going to choose the same color of that green right. because you've made a bunch of sapperlings and it'll count the sapperlings you made as permanents of that color so it'll at least double that yeah it reminds me of devotion a little bit yeah uh, except for instead of you're looking instead of looking for the pips of the colors you're looking for how many tokens of or how many creatures of that no sorry how many permanents yeah. of that color yeah you have on the battlefield with the awakener is also very similar to intet the dreamer which we did a uh, deck tech on for my dragon week deck uh -huh. where it's a if you hit someone with the uh with the commander you can pay a two and a color and you get an activated ability right this was a whole cycle there's a whole ton of them yeah that do similar things uh yeah and and rith actually will make tokens for even the permanence in that color that your opponents control so it's just permanence on the battlefield that are of that color yeah so that's pretty powerful um it can be extremely powerful sometimes it could also just be like all right you made two guys or yeah at least next time, then you're probably going to make at least three because you have Rith, you have two green sapperling tokens, right. so it can sort of snowball, but you're right. It, it can be a little slow. The other thing about Rith is he costs six mana, which is quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, especially if he dies twice, and now he's costing 10 mana. Uh, he's, he's still very powerful, and he's a 6-6 six, six flyer, so in a multiplayer game, there's a good chance you can at least hit one person because he does right. have to deal combat damage to a player to activate the ability. Yeah, and he's also in green, so getting him out is not going to be a huge issue if you have any amount of ramp yes. uh, in your deck. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. That is nice. The other really good thing about Rith uh, is that these token colors, I think, are the best three colors at making tokens. Yeah. White's really good at it. Green's really good at it. Red's really good at it. Black and blue are sort of... They, they have cards that make tokens, but they're not as prolific at doing those things. So he sort of allows you to play the colors that are naturally the best at making tokens. So that's definitely an upside of playing Rith as your commander. Yeah, especially in a token deck, which uh, Rith seems to be screaming out to want because it seems like the most natural uh, synergy is to make a lot of the tokens, hit someone with Rith, 
and then count the number of those color tokens you have, and you just put out a ton more. So let's say you have 10 white soldiers out there. You hit someone with Rith, you get 10 green sapperlings, and then you do any kind of overwhelm or just... Crater Hope Behemoth, Crater Behemoth or something. Effect, yeah, and then you win the game. Then you win. Um, let me just read really quickly what Kyle wrote in his email that he may be having trouble with or issues with the deck. So he says, I've had mild success with this deck and would love to make it more consistent. When it does work, there is nothing like throwing out a fungal sprouting for 23, which is 23 <laughs> saplings, with Cather's Crusade and doubling season in play and then swinging for a bajillion. So it definitely, that's the kind of thing token decks will do, which is make yeah. 23 guys and simultaneously make them all, you know, gain 22 extra power. So you just have like 500 damage sitting there on the board. Yeah. But consistency is a real problem with token decks. Well, also just having doubling season out for more than a turn is a problem with token decks. Right. People know how crazy powerful it is. Catherine's Crusade, too. And plus, you need so much dice. Well, think of what he just said. So many dice. That's like <laughs> three very specific cards. Yeah. And doubling season has a, a couple other cards that do what it does. But, you know, that's one of maybe three cards in your deck. Catherine's Crusade really doesn't. You know, there's a few cards like Crater Hoof that can sort of stand in for what Cathar is doing. Mm -hmm. Plus, in that scenario, you would want haste. Otherwise, you got to sit there and say go and hope that nobody board wipes by the time he gets back to your turn. Like, yeah. that's a lot of cards you got to put together for the win. So I hear what he's saying about consistency. Um because token decks can definitely explode out and do crazy things, but they can also be something where you're sitting there on turn six or seven and you just literally can't do much. You're like, I make four dudes and somebody's just smashing you with Animar. And, you know, you're this like... This is a repeat of last night, actually. This actually happened last night, yeah. <laughs> um, it was cool. You did make a bunch of dudes and then Animar's like, I'm pro-white. I just smashed you in the face. Okay. Yeah, you can't do anything about it. Um, so Kyle has a good start to the deck right now, but what the point of Deck Doctors is, we're going to tell you what you can take out and place with what we're going to try and prioritize, and also to address what you want to do in the deck. So let's uh, let's get to it. Yeah, okay. So some statistics really quick. So when breaking down Kyle's deck, we noticed a few things. Uh, you know we like to talk about certain categories. Each deck has two that are always present, card draw and mana ramp. And yep. then there will be some deck-specific sort of categories. Um, so right now we noticed Kyle's deck has only four cards that I would classify as card draw cards. Hmm. So that seems extremely low, and that's probably the main thing that's hurting what he calls consistency. Yeah. Um, there are nine mana ramp cards. That's pretty good. That's decent. It's close. I would want that maybe a little higher if I could, but I think that that's not bad. Yeah. Um, well, this is a mana-hungry deck, too. Yes. Actually, most EDH decks are mana-hungry. Token decks scale tend to scale really well, though, with extra mana. So you can yeah. even go farther in the mana ramp because you have a lot of cards that say pay white, white, and X and get X one ones. Right. And so if you, have, if you have 20 mana and you can't do anything with it, you, you can make extra dudes. You know, so that's... Mana rep can work even in your favor a little more in a token deck because you have a lot more ways to spend that mana. That's a good point. Um, and then there's... So this the two categories that we sort of made for this deck specifically are token generators, which we talked about in the archetype ep episode. Um, there's about 23 cards that make tokens in this deck, which is good. Seems a little teeny bit low to me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's quite a few, and you would definitely want that that category to be the largest category yeah now Rith is your commander so he also makes tokens and you always have access to him so i could see being a little low on the token creation because you know yeah. well at least i always have access to this one card that makes tokens but he's conditional mm -hmm. he doesn't just come in and make tokens you have to also swing with him and, and connect so and then the last category we sort of combined uh cards that pump or just take advantage of tokens so that you might sack a token to and get some effect we combine that into one category and there's about 15 of those interesting which seems pretty good to that me seems pretty good too yeah. yeah so i think we just want to up the things that make tokens and find ways to make this deck more consistent so card draw ramp and cards that make tokens definitely are the uh because you definitely don't want too much of the last category because if you, if, are, you, if you have a hand that's like five token like utility cards and two token generators <laughs> Yeah, Separate you're it. not happy because you're like, well, I can't actually take advantage of the pump cards or the yeah. utilities things. I you need also don't dudes. have any lands, so you should probably mulligan anyway. <laughs> well, and we've talked about that before, whereas if you have a hand that has all token creation but no utility or pump cards, yeah. you're okay because you're going to at least... Because you can win with just you know 40 tokens. Yeah. You, know, you can just attack past them, go wide. You can't win with just a bunch of stuff that is asking you to sack tokens, but you don't have tokens. So... 
the the thing you run into when you're in this position that Kyle's in is you have a deck. It has 99 cards in it. Where do you add the card draw, the mana ramp, those other things you want, but without taking away? Yeah. You know, it feels like, man, in order to hit all the numbers that I want to hit, my deck would have to be 125 cards. So this is where the deck doctors sort of get to work. Time to go to surgery. Finding those places where I can replace two cards with one card. Yeah. That kind of thing. So The two for one, the VDH. That's why the format's so cool. Yeah, exactly. There's so many cards that does that do a ton of stuff. So in the last two deck doctors, our big thing was really focus. In this one, I feel like our big thing is really efficiency. Mm-hmm. So this deck is focused pretty well. It knows what it wants to do. It's making tokens. It's pumping them up. But... It needs to take a lot of cards that are sort of... It's not that they're bad. It's just that they're not as good as they could be, maybe. And they're not filling two roles. Yeah, the synergy isn't there. They're still powerful, but they're not necessarily what you want. Right. So we're going to break this one down a little bit differently. We're going to go through each category and talk about a few cards we would take out that fit in that category and what we would add in. So... The first category is ramp. Ah. Now, remember, we had nine ramp cards, but I think we can still up our ramp factor. So Yeah. So the first card that we want to take out is Farhaven Elf. And Farhaven Elf is a great card mm-hmm. because if you read Farhaven Elf, it's a, it's, so it's a creature that essentially comes into play and grabs you a, a basic land, and it comes onto the battlefield tapped and just costs three mana. And it's great. It's a, it's a ramp card that gets you further on your mana. I play this in my Animar deck all the time because yep. you get a creature. But the reason I play this in my Animar deck is because you get a creature. And sometimes you can just play this for one green, get a land, and you put a token on Animar. In this deck, it doesn't synergize as well as you would like it to. It's not that the card's bad or doing anything wrong. It's just it's only doing this one thing, and it doesn't actually work with your deck at all. In fact, the next card on the list is the, basically the exact same card. It's Wood Elves. Mm-hmm. Um, it does basically the same thing. Yeah. So I but won't this read one puts it. A, a, at least this comes, the land comes in untapped, which is kind of nice, and it's a, any kind of forest. Right. But it's still not what you're... Because you're not m- taking advantage of that land coming into play. Exactly. You can't flicker it. You're not bouncing it back to your hand and replaying it. You just can't reuse that ability so it's like a one time i get a one one and another extra land it's just you can do better than that you um, can do better boy you can do better the next Kid. two the next two cards are very similar uh kodama's reach and explosive vegetation uh, again i don't want to get into too specific about reading the exact cards they're just sorceries that go and put lands into play and sometimes give you extra lands yeah. to your hand it's the same deal they're not bad cards these are strong cards they're ramp cards they fix your mana they ramp your mana. They're one-time sorcery use. But again, they're not interacting with anything else you're doing. You yeah. don't have a way to get sorceries back from your graveyard. You don't have a way to abuse these cards in any way. So while the floor on them is pretty high because they're always going to do what they're going to do, the ceiling is not that high. They can't ever do more than what they're supposed to do. So yep. you can't flick them. You can't reuse them. So what do we want to replace these cards with? Um, the first one that we thought of is awakening zone yeah this is uh it's it's only been printed three times actually and it's like a two dollar three dollar rare because of it but it's amazing it was from rise of the eldrazi it's two ingredients in enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep you put a zero one colorless eldrazi spawn creature token on the battlefield if you guys play modern masters 2015 you guys know what these guys do they sack themselves you can add one colorless man to your mana pool but notice how it does two things here yes exactly a creature onto the battlefield and it's a token and you can sack it for mana. So, so what did this card do? Now, where we're let's say we took out Farhaven Elf. Farhaven Elf was in the ramp category. Mm-hmm. We put in Awakening Zone. Awakening Zone's in the ramp category and the token generation category. So we just added a token generator without losing any ramp. Right. It's a different kind of ramp, but arguably Farhaven Elf, while well, it gets you a land, and that land may be a specific color of mana, and you know these Eldrazi spawns are only colorless. That's not actually something that you're necessarily worried about in the deck because that small like difference in what you're getting doesn't actually change your game plan in the long run. And just the overall value you get from Awakening Zone is way more valuable. And think about the things that Awakening Zone is going to work with. We know we're going to have doubling season in any token deck. We're going to mm-hmm. have parallel lives in any token deck. But Crater Hoof Behemoth works yeah, with, the, with these tokens. Stuff. Yeah, and all your pump spells. If you have anything where you need to sacrifice a creature, Awakening Zone works you know, every turn for that. So it's just so much stronger in a token deck 
to be able to hit those two categories. Uh, yeah, the, not to mention it's it's better, I think, late game. Because even though it takes a turn to get you a 0-1 into play, you're always getting a chump blocker every turn if you're in that unenviable position where you can't attack someone and you're trying to stop someone from coming at you. Yeah, and if you're late game, like one extra land probably doesn't do a whole lot. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. The next one we have is slightly different. doesn't necessarily hit two categories. It's the Sitenul Herophants. Herophants. I've never even seen this card before. I don't even know how to pronounce it, but yeah, I put it in uh, token decks. It says, pay three and a green for a 3-2 druid. It says, each creature you control gains, tap and add green to your mana pool. So each creature you control becomes a Lanwar Elf in addition to whatever else it does. That's pretty sweet. So now think of this. you got Awakening Zone in play. Every time you create a dude that you can tap for a green and then sacrifice for a colorless. Oh my gosh. So that's insane. They're all two mana rock, like two mana dudes. And then if any other token creator you have, if you just put four or five guys out, play the Sitinol Herophants. Yeah. Is that my pronounce? I have no idea. Herophants? I don't Sitinol Herophants. And summon druids. It's two plural. words I don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> um, it turns all your guys into land the, the best thing about this card is you play it. All your other creatures, if they were already in play, you can immediately tap them for the green. Right. If that's something sick. Yeah, yeah. So it sort of gives them this ability with haste. So why play this over explosive vegetation, say? Because well, you can get a billion mana. <laughs> because the ceiling is so much higher. Yeah. Like explosive vegetation, you know exactly what it does. It gets you a couple extra mana a, a, a few turns before you should get it. Sentinel Hero fonts could get you 40 extra mana. Yeah. And then you could tap that and play a, one of those X spells and make 100 dudes. It's a card that reminds me of Raphelos and Gaia's Cradle. Yes. And it's way cheaper than Gaia's Cradle, so. Oh, he, and by the way, Kyle has Gaia's Cradle on his list, so I'm like, hey, you can keep it in there if you've yeah. got it, dude. Good, oh, my way gosh. To go. If you had that and the Sentinel Hero fonts out in, like, 10 creatures, you could make upwards of 30 mana or something. Easy. I mean, maybe maybe in the hundreds of mana. Um and your board could look pretty innocuous before that, too. It's right. a crazy thing. Yeah, exactly. So that is another card that we would maybe replace. Um, the next one. Uh, oh, yeah. Perilous Forays. This is an enchantment. Uh, and again, enchantments, I think, are kind of key to token decks. You're trying to change the world to your like benefit. So things that, like Cathar's Crusade, that give you plus one, plus one counters, or yep. just boost your whole team up with plus one, plus one, are important. Perilous Forays is three and two green. Uh, you can pay one colorless to sacrifice a creature. Search your library for a land card with a basic land type and put it into play tapped, then shuffle your library. So this is a repeatable uh, Farhaven Elf-esque effect uh, where you get to just continually ramp cards for one colorless. You get one extra mana. Like you could do, like if you need a giant turn, you're like, I need to get eight mana by next turn and I don't have enough. Like I just need two lands. I'll we'll just like, sack two one ones. Sack two one ones, yeah. Yep. Guess what? You aren't going to lose that much value for losing those one ones and maybe your Awakening Zone puts out another zero one anyway because you're just going to play Crater of Behemoth and win. Yep. And now we're not going to talk about this specific, or we are going to talk about this specific category a little bit later, but one of the things token decks need are ways to sort of protect you from board wipes. Mm -hmm. So this is a way where somebody board wipes, you've got five things. At least you can turn that into five lands that are in play. You know, so it just gives you a little bit extra value in the case of like something sort of bad happens. Yeah. And if you're actually fetching like five to 10 lands out of your deck with this, it's as powerful as something like land tax because you just, you really do actually thin your deck um, if you're taking a significant number of cards out of it. Just they getting... come into play too. So it's just very powerful. I yeah. mean, it's, it's ramp. So it's yeah. even better than land tax in some ways. Yeah. It's great against board wipes. I, I didn't realize that. That's awesome. Uh, the next. Two really are. We've talked about these cards in conjunction many times. It's Ashnod's Altar and Phyrexian Altar. They're both artifacts. They both cost three. They both say sacrifice a creature. And then Ashnod says if you sacrifice a creature, add two colorless mana to your mana pool. And Phyrexian Altar is if you sacrifice a creature, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Yeah. Um, so these are both ramp cards, and they're seminal. 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 They are seminal. They so are every seminal. Token deck, you kind of need them. They're similar to Sitinul Herophants because... Uh, <laughs> You're just having a... a why did yeah. I pick that card? I have to say it like every 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> so again, it's like their ceiling is so high. You can just make... you. A lot of times, Ashnod's Altar does this thing where I have 10 tokens in play. I sack all of them and make 20 mana. Then I play an X spell and I turn that into 20 guys in play. Right. I sack all those. I make 40 mana. I play another X spell. I So I went from 10 guys in play yeah. to 
you know, 80 guys in play with two spells or something. It's very, very powerful. Uh, yeah, these cards are definitely like must includes in token decks. Yeah, and we talked about this a lot in our episode with Matt Arnold, where he says tokens should not be seen as anything but your own currency. Sort of, they are your, uh, they're for they're there for you to use in a way that is advantageous. So if you use them like they're money, or use them in, in a way that you can spend them, and both of these altars are exactly that. It's like you're going to the bank. You're like, I'll give you my one one if you give me two colorless mana. They're like, deal. And you're like, awesome. I have 51 ones. Give me a ton of mana. They're like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> Let me check the vault. Yeah, they're, they're like, right, okay, it works. I can just keep sacking them. This is a very bloody altar. <laughs> but it'll work. If you look at the pictures, that's actually on theme too because the altars don't, they look bloody. They should look bloody. A lot of creatures have died to them. <laughs> Uh, and then the last card we'll talk about um, is expensive. We like to make sure that we're we're letting you know when there are spendy cards that you could use if you if you have them or, or well, you're so desired. He's got guys cradle in the deck, so this that's true. Be, I'm assuming Kyle can afford to. Yeah, maybe he just has that left over, or maybe it's gold border or something though. Oh we don't yes, know. gold border guys cradle yeah. is awesome. Um, you want to read it? Yeah, it's Earthcraft. One in the green for an enchantment. Tap an untapped creature you control. Untap target basic land. And it seems like this is the kind of deck that wants a lot of basic lands, especially if you're playing um, Perilous Forays and stuff and, mm -hmm. and just any kind of ramp in general. Um, so you only need really one in play to make true. a ton of mana because you just keep untapping the same one and or tapping Or one it. of each color if you yeah. need specific colors. Yeah, because you can point. just tap one guy, untap it, float the mana, and you just keep going and going and going. And this going famously going. goes infinite with a few things like Squirrel's Nest because mm -hmm. you make the squirrel, then tap the squirrel to untap the nest, then do it again. Right. Just a billion squirrels on yeah. the table. But a lot of times just not going infinite with Earthcraft just like i now have you know 40 mana available to me right or yeah. also sometimes when it's like i need three green to play crater hook behemoth yeah sometimes you just need to untap that forest a couple of times yep. um another card that's similar to earthcraft in a way but isn't uh super expensive i wrote down a sprout swarm it's one oh, of the green nice. it's a convoke instant with buyback for three so when every time you uh, cat, uh, play a card that has buyback you can pay an additional mana cost of whatever it is, and then you get to put the card back in your hand. So it's just something to do with your creatures at instant speed. So you can just convoke out and put a 1-1 green sapling creature token into play for 5 mana, and you can do it for free. So you can do it on end steps. You can just keep doing and it over and over again. And you just keep, keep to buy back, and yeah. then, yeah. Yeah, so it's just another way to use your creatures to tap them down, because convoke is a very powerful mechanic. and Especially, especially with tokens. With token decks, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a very good card. Okay, so let's move on to the card draw category. Now, he only had four card draw spells, so I'm not looking to take out any of them. They're all good. Yeah. Uh, we've mentioned Mentor for the Meek before. It's it's just a creature that anytime a small creature enters the battlefield, you pay mana and you draw cards. Yeah. He also has Skull Clamp. We've talked about that a million times. If yeah, you don't that's know, that's an automatic include in any kind of deck. Yeah, and and Kyle has it in the deck. He knows. He knows that's a good card. Yeah. Good uh, everybody <laughs> out there should know that by now. Skull Clamp goes in a million decks. Um, and basically you need a reason not to put skull clamp in your deck. It's just very, it's just that good. So we're going to yeah. talk about some other cards that are card draw that need to be included in the deck. Uh, the first one I have is slate of ancestry. Slate of ancestry is a four drop artifact. It says pay four and tap it, discard your hand. Hold on. Stay with me here. <laughs> it also says draw a card for each creature you control. But what if I have zero cards in my hand? Oh, wait. Perfect. Or let's say you have five cards in your hand, but you have 12 creatures in play. Yeah. Which often happens with a token deck. Okay, I'll just discard my five cards and draw 12 more. That's totally fine. I also hope you have anger in your hand because that could be your win condition. Good I point. Yeah. Good point. And I hope you do have anger in the deck. Um, we should know, actually. We have the list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next one uh, is Fecundity. Fecundity. Uh, it's got a very sad looking alligator on it. And when I say that, I mean the alligator is dead. It's a skull of an it's alligator. A, yeah. It's a two and a green for an enchantment. Whenever a creature dies, that, that creature's controller may draw a card. So it's a world enchantment. Everyone is affected by this. But again, we've talked about these cards a bunch of times. If you are getting the most benefit out of it, and if you're trying to race the clock, or if you're trying to beat someone down before they can kill you, it, you don't care how many cards they draw because that might be the turn you win when you play this card. You go, like, great, I will do this. And then I'll sack eight guys to get eight. Uh, to you know, the altar, you draw eight cards, you'll probably draw into that X spell we were talking about. You play more guys, you go your, with your Slate of Ancestry and dump your hand and draw even more stuff. You know, you go nuts over here. Yeah, it can lead to these turns where you're literally drawing like as many cards as you want. Yeah. And with the altars, like you said, you can play those cards because you're creating mana when you sack the guys. Yeah. Fecundity, fecundity. I think it's fecundity. 
I, whatever. Man, this this episode is hard on pronunciation it's for no me. It's no Citadel Elephants or whatever the heck that guy <laughs> <Elephants>. was. Elephants. Let's <laughs> draw a trunk on him. Yeah. And then, <laughs> uh, the next card, I'm, I'm just going to go through these quickly because uh, there there's card draw cards in these color. Outpost Siege, a new card, yeah. fairly new. It, it It's virtual card draw. Sylvan Library, yeah. which... Which we have talked about. I think it was my number one green card in our top ten. It I says, think it is actually. It's it's amazing. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's also a more expensive card. It's like on the same level as Earthcraft. Yeah, it's a little spendy. It's uh, at the beginning of your draw step, you may draw two additional cards. If you do, choose two cards in your hand drawn this turn. For each of those cards, pay four life or put the card on the top of your library. So you basically draw extra cards for four life, and you get to pick from one of three if you don't do that. Yeah. It costs a lot of life to do it, but it's also, it does, like, Miri's Guile. You can just reorganize the cards and put them back on the top of your library, and you get to choose one out of the top three of your cards. So it's kind of like a, a Sensei's Divining Top in a way. It's yeah, got, that's a good, it's got really a good. lot of power in it. Divining Top, another card you might think about putting in. Again, it's a little bit spendy. Um, it goes in every deck ever. <laughs> Uh, Overwhelming Instinct is another card that's a very cheap option. It's two in a green. Whenever you attack with three or more creatures, draw a card. So this is definitely po uh, putting you more in the aggro range of things, and we usually don't like to go too aggressive, but this is just a great way to be like, hey, I have three zero ones. I'm just going to swing at you to draw a card. It does no damage. Please don't block. You know, it, it requires a little bit of work on the politicking side, but it can also just be, hey, look, I'm just going to beat down, and you're going to die this turn, and I'm going to swing at you anyway, so I'll just draw off of it. It can also be like, I don't care if I lose these three 1-1s. One I just yeah. need extra cards. It's not the greatest option, but it is an option, and it's very inexpensive. So we did want to put some cheap options on there because yeah. Sylvan Library is not cheap. And people definitely will not be too happy if you're just overwhelming instinct everyone around the table to draw cards. Right. I mean, if they just have like three guys that just get to eat your guys, yeah. then I mean, they don't that's care. That's not so bad for them. Yeah, they're yeah. Like final block. And maybe you don't care if, you know, as long as you draw the card and maybe you've got, you know, 12 guys, so what's another couple guys doing for you? Yeah, that's true. You The cards that you draw into are way more important than the three one ones or zero ones that you may be sacrificing. Okay, so let's go into the next category, which is token generators. So we're going to talk about some cards here that um, Kyle may want to take out of the deck. Uh, the first one is Elspeth Knight Errant. And Els this is one of the best Elspeths ever, noticeably. Yeah. But it, we're asking you to take it out for a specific reason. It seems crazy to take it out. And like we said at the very start, it's not that these cards are bad. And you could definitely get away with having them in the deck. Mm -hmm. It's just that you need, you know, we're trying to push this deck into the next level. And I think the way to do that is to look critically at all the cards, regardless of, you know, people saying this is the best Elspeth ever, ever or whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. So Elspeth is two and two white for a planeswalker. She comes in with four loyalty. Her plus one is put a one one white soldier creature token onto the battlefield. Bing. Like, hey, that sounds great. Tokens, yeah. We're making tokens. Her plus one is target creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains flying until end of turn. That's pretty cool. It's cool. So but it's one of the few Planeswalkers that has two pluses on her before her ultimate, which is minus eight, and then you get an emblem with artifacts, creatures, enchantments, and lands you control are indestructible. So it's like an Avacyn on crack. Um, but the thing is, yeah, there's not that much upside because there's a better Elspeth in the deck, and you've already got it in there, and Sun's Champion because she puts out three, three one ones. ones. Yeah. And she board wipes everything power four or greater, so yep. she, she goes over the head of your little dudes and board wipes everything else. Yeah. And this Elspeth, really, that plus uh, three is so not impactful. The first the, one? You mean the plus one? I mean, one? So the, the second plus one. So the plus yeah. three, plus three, and flying. Oh, right, yeah. It sounds cool, but then you're like, I plus her and I hit somebody for four damage with my one one yeah. dude, or maybe five or six damage, depending. Like, It's not that great. Rith already has flying. Uh, and then... Of course, we always talk about this. The ultimate, it's great. It gives everything indestructible, but... You're not getting there very often because Elspeth paints a huge target on your back. Any Planeswalker does, so you don't ever evaluate the Planeswalker really on the ultimate. I know you have doubling season in the deck, mm -hmm. but you just want your Planeswalker to be good even if you don't ultimate. And I don't think, really, Elspeth, most of the time, you're going to put her out and then just make one dude. Yeah. You can four do mana better. for one dude. Yeah, you can definitely do better. Also, her ability, I think, ties in just much better with Voltron-esque decks or decks that want to get specific creatures through. Like a Geist of St. Traft deck would use this Elspeth because you want to swing with Geist and get those angels out, and you don't want Geist to die. So yes. making him huge and flying is a great way to do that. Yep. Um, yeah, you want to be able to use both the modes, the, 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 the first two modes. Yeah. And I really think you're only using the one, and even that one, 
again, it's low floor or it's high floor, but the ceiling's really low. You yeah. can't like how do you abuse it? You're making one one one. And one thing that I like to note is that I usually do this with cards like Elspeth. I'll put them in the deck because I pulled them from a pack or they're just super awesome and I, I see them in my binder and I haven't been able to put them anywhere. I'm like, this deck plays white. I'll play Elspeth. You know, it's a planeswalker. I'm sure she'll be useful. And yeah, she is useful when you play her out, but you do kind of have to run the feel bads when you have to realize that like, even though the card's super awesome, you don't necessarily need to put it in the deck if it doesn't synergize particularly well with your deck. Well said, well said. Yeah. Uh, next card is Living Hive. Oh yeah, it's a giant beater. It's six and, t- and six and green, green for a six six trample. And whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you put that many one one green insect creature tokens into play. Um, for eight mana, there's a better card you could be playing. It's Crater Hoof Behemoth <laughs> for the fiftieth time we've said it this episode. <laughs> yes, Living Hive is super expensive. And then it's conditional. There are a lot of cards that you play them and they already just make tokens. Yeah, for one mana more, uh, you get to play Insurrection. No, actually, Insurrection is eight mana, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so for the same amount of mana, you can play Just take everybody's stuff and win. Yeah. Living Hive is cool, but I think it's a little cute. Yes, that's a really good word for it. And it's also tough to really get it to do what you want for eight mana if you're if you're like putting three one ones into play when he when he swings in with trample because they have a three three the block you're not going to be feeling that good you'd rather do something that's much more high impact or just you know have the ability to have more flexibility with cards like even just having taking out a creature to put in an altar is way better because that mana you're getting from that allows you to go off in different ways that's more impactful than playing just a six six Another card that Kyle has in here that we think may want to come out is Fungal Sprouting. It's three and a green. It says put X one one green sapperling tokens onto the battlefield where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. Again, this card sounds great, but you're in a token deck. A lot of the time, you're not going to have anything on the battlefield that's got more than one or two power. Mm-hmm. So this is going to do nothing in those instances. Plus, if you ever draw it and you don't have any tokens and you don't have any creatures, it does literal nothing. Yeah. I'd rather have an, a green a, an, a spell that said pay green an X and put X sapperlings onto the battlefield because in that instance, if I have nothing, I can at least create five or six tokens. Mm-hmm. Fungus Browding is nice, but it's more better in a deck that has big creatures. Just yeah, exactly. And you in- need yeah, and you have a very specific use for the tokens. Because yep. if you just have like a five five and you're putting five guys out for three mana, again, that's good. It's good value, but there again are more cards that do two things at once. I mean, if that's the best case scenario, which it is, because you're not just not often gonna have I mean maybe well, Rift's six, out. Six, so yeah, six. six would you're be gonna the have best case, I think. Making six tokens for four mana, that's good. But that's the best case scenario. Yeah. Whereas some of these X spells, if you draw them on turn twelve you're going to make 11 dudes. Yeah. You know, which you fungal sprouting just can't do. But also if you draw them on turn 6 and you don't have any creatures in play, you can still make 5 or 6 dudes. So, mm. yeah, that's the reason I, I don't love that card. Yeah, and then the last card for the token generators that we think may need to go is similar to Elspeth. It's Garrick Primal Hunter uh, because there's actually a better Garrick for the deck, we think. Uh, but Garrick is two green, green, green. So he's a bit harder to cast on turn five. And he puts a beast creature onto the token on the battlefield. And then his second ability, his minus three, is actually kind of similar to what, why Fungal Sprouting is not that good. Uh, you draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. Uh, so that's just more difficult again because you're, I mean, you could draw. Also, s- it's minus three to yeah, do that. Yeah, it's minus three. It'll kill him immediately if you do it. Um, so paying five mana to draw potentially six cards is a good value. But again, there are better things to do. Well, and that's best case scenario. Sometimes yeah. you're going to play five. Uh, mana and only draw one card because right. you'll only have one once. Well, think for like four mana instead of five mana, you could have a mentor of the meek out and then play a lingering souls and draw two cards off of that. Yep. And you have now two tokens, a card you can flash back, and two cards in your hand. And a lot of and and the card's going to keep drawing you cards over the long run instead of just dying immediately. And we won't even read the ultimate because it really doesn't matter. Um, so speaking of Garrick, let's go to the the replacement cards that we would suggest to put in the place of some of these cards that we're taking out. Garrick has axed himself to put his new version in Garrick's there. like, don't use this me, use this other me. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's Garrick Wildspeaker, which I have been on record a few times now saying this is my favorite Planeswalker. He's pretty good. Yeah, he, he doesn't sound awesome, which is one of the reasons he's good, if that makes sense. Because he people don't look at him and go, oh man, we need to kill that guy right now. Right. All his abilities are good, though. Yeah, he's two and two green for a three loyalty planeswalker. He is a plus one, is untapped to target lands. Lands, by the way, not basic lands, yep, just lands. Just lands. So now he's ramp. 
His minus one is put a 3-3 three, three green beast token onto the battlefield. So, so it's he's, the same as the plus one for Primal Hunter. Yep, so he's making tokens. His minus four, yes, his ultimate is only minus four. And he only costs four, which is great. Yep, his minus four is creatures you control get plus three, plus three, and gain trample until end of turn. So this sounds like a much better Planeswalker for the deck because all three modes, even though we're not super in love with just the minus to make one token mode, uh, all three modes are still relevant, and it's like three cards in one. Yeah, it's it, how many categories is this hitting? Ramp, token creation, token and utility. pumping your tokens. Yeah, that's yeah. insane. That's this card is hitting three of your categories. This card is awesome in this deck. Uh, definitely needs to be included. Yeah, uh, big fan of Garrick Wildspeaker. Also easier to cast because he only has two green symbols in his mana cost, so you can definitely get him out early. Um, and another great card came from Dragons of Tarkir. Actually, it's Secure the Wastes. It's a very simple card. It's X and white. It's an instant, however. You put X-1-1 one, one white warrior creature tokens onto the battlefield. That instant part is so important. Yeah. It's great to do end step. Yep. Uh, it's great to do just... It's a great way to sink your mana in. And like Josh said, if you have this and National Zalter out and you have like 10 creatures, you can turn it into 19 or 20 or whatever. You can just all of a sudden, like, I've got, I've got you know, 30 creatures that I put in at the end step before my turn, so they basically have haste. Yeah. Now I untap, play Crater Hope Behemoth, win. This is one of those cards that bursts forward from out of nowhere, kills everyone. Those are the cards, you know, that do so well in EDH because so often that's how you win. Yeah. Yeah, I love that card. Element of surprise. That's right. Um, and the last one is Namata, Grove Guardian. It's four and two green for a four or five legend tree folk. Yeah, you can make a commander out of this. Yep. It says pay two and a green to put a one one sapperling token creature onto play. So it just makes one ones for three mana. You don't have to tap it. So if you have six mana, you can make two. And then you can sacrifice a sapperling, and all sapperlings get plus one, plus one until end of turn. So, again, just hitting two categories, making a dude, pumping your dudes. He's also a sack outlet. Yep. Because um, for the cards I try, your card anytime a creature dies or whatever, this is also nice and useful. Three categories. Holy cow. Holy cow. Have a cow. Have a sapperling. Have a <laughs> plus one, plus one sapperling. Uh, all right, let's talk about pump slash utility, which is the last category of the uh, sort of how we broke the deck down originally. Um, so we're going to go through these cards on a one-for-one -one basis just to show one thing that we uh, think could be replaced with something that's slightly better. So the first up would be Fires of Yavamaya, which is an enchantment that gives your creatures haste. And of course, we're not saying that's not important. That's a very important ability. Um, but it only kind of does one thing. I mean, the other thing is, as you can sacrifice it to give one creature plus two plus two until end of turn, which is all right. But I think there's a better version out there. Yeah, the Fires of Yavi. Basically, you're playing it because it gives all your creatures haste, right? That yep. secondary ability is not that good. Just pumping one creature one time, and you have to sack the fires to do it. Mm -hmm. So I would replace it with Hammer of Perforos. It's um. one. It's one and two red. It's a legendary artifact, enchantment artifact. It says creatures you control have haste. Hey. So it's the same as Fires of Yavimaya. Same converted mana cost. Same converted well. mana cost. Slightly harder to cast, but still not too tough. Um, but then it has an activated ability. You pay two and a red and tap the hammer. Sacrifice a land. Put a 3-3 three, three colorless golem enchantment artifact creature token onto the battlefield. So you sack a land, make a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. Not that you'll always want to do that because sacking a land sounds bad. Well, remember, if you go back to our ramp category, we have tons of different ways to get lands out now. Yep, and you have doubling season. You yeah. have parallel lives. We didn't specifically talk about those cards. They're definitely in every token deck, or they should be. And so now, if you're sacking a land to make two three threes, pretty good. And you can do this in, st in places where, like, you're desperate. You need a guy to block. You yeah, need exactly. Yeah, so it just gives you additional versatility. Yeah. Uh, next card is a card that I like a lot, but uh, it's called Glare of the Subduel. It's two green and white. An enchantment tapped and untap, uh, tap and untap creature you control, tap target artifact or creature. So you can think like the upside is like, oh, I could tap down their soul rings or their gilded lotuses right. and stuff on, you know, before they get to use them. I'll force them to do it during their upkeep and stuff. But you're trying to do this to, I mean, ideally, I think you'd want to do this because you want to get through and kill someone. Like, all right, uh, your N7, I'm going to tap down your whole board, and then I'm going to be able to swing in. Um, I, there is a better version, though, I think. Well, it's not that it's a better version. I, To me, Glare of the Subduel is good. It's very good. Mm -hmm. And you can think of all these instances where it's good. Oh, I tap your guy before you attack like with your Rafik. Or, like you said, I tap down all your guys before my turn, and then now I can attack for, 
without it getting blocked, or I can tap your certain artifacts. Mm -hmm. However, then there's a lot of instances where it's no good. It's like all your artifacts don't care if they're tapped, which a lot of artifacts don't care if they're tapped or untapped. They're just doing their thing. Howling Mines and stuff like that, they don't care if they're tapped or untapped. Also, most of the decks where you'd really want to tap down a specific creature because you can't block it, Mm -hmm. that creature is hexproof. So most of the time, because you've got a, you've got tokens, you're not worried about creatures attacking you unless they're unblockable or something, because you can just block with your one one. So a uh, Rafik deck's only scary in the instances where you probably couldn't tap him anyway because he's got hexproof or shroud. Yeah, and so, he's unblockable for whatever reason. So. Exactly. Not that glare is bad, and it definitely can work. And if you have it in the deck, it's gonna do some things. I just think you've got to look for these little places where it's like, yeah, that card's good, but it's not always good. Mm-hmm. Can I find a card that's always good? And one that I really like is Martyr's Bond, which it's like is the white version of Grave Pact. It is. It's White's Grave Pact. Martyr's Pact. It's a <laughs> four and two white for an enchantment. Whenever Martyr's Bond or another non-land permanent you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices a permanent that shares a card type with it. Whoa. So this is kind of cool. If an enchantment dies, they all have to sack an enchantment. If a creature dies, which by the way, you're gonna have a lot and you have sack outlets. They have to sacrifice a creature. Yeah, that's actually really cool about the enchantment bit because you have a lot of enchantments on here that are really powerful. Mm-hmm. So if you put out a doubling season, someone else only has one enchantment out. Someone's like, "Well, we have to get rid of it." It's like, no, but then they can't just aura shards well you yeah. into oblivion because you, you'll eventually get rid of their aura shards with this. Also, grave pact. We know dictate of Erebos, super super powerful in token decks, but you're not playing black, so this gets you that effect. Yeah, definitely. Um, another card that we thought was not probably ideal would be foundry champion it's a six mana creature and he's breathing a lot of fire he's four red and a white he's a four four when he enters the battlefield deals damage to target creature or player equal to the number of creatures you control and for a red you can give him plus one plus zero for a white give him plus zero plus one till end of turn um you already have a lot of creatures in play if you already have 20 creatures like josh said you're gonna you're gonna win you're in good shape but also just gonna merc one person maybe yeah in which case why aren't you just playing crater hoof behemoth right Crater Hoof's not on Kyle's list. It definitely needs to be. It's probably the, be, maybe Skull Clamp's the most powerful, but it's probably the second most powerful card in the deck. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Doubling Season. I'll put it third. Yeah. Um, <laughs> still pretty good. Still pretty good. I'm not going to read Crater Hoof. We all know what it does. It comes into play. It gives it pumps all your creatures to an amazing de- degree and gives them trample, and then you win. Yep. Uh, so And he has haste as well. Yeah. And, and with Crater Hoof, you can literally do these weird calculations where you do 170,000 damage spread out among however many players. Like, that's the kind of card it is. Fandry Champion's almost never going to do that. Yeah, I mean, it might come down and kill one person, but you could have done that with Greater Hoof and killed maybe three or four people. Exactly. I mean, we're not necessarily saying take out Foundry Champion. Maybe it has worked very well and you're playing three-player games and just killing one person is enough for you to secure, like, your position on the board. But in terms of just sheer power level and what you're trying to do with the card, Crater Hoof is sort of the ideal version of Foundry Champion. Yeah. I mean, I'd say unless you're playing 1v1, take out Foundry Champion, put in Crater Hoof. Yeah. Uh, oh, and the last one of these one-for-one one takeout replace, I'm going to say Plea for Guidance. Uh, oh, yes. This, this card seems like a card that you would very much want in the deck, and you do want this effect. It's a sorcery. It costs five and a white. That's the big thing. Six mana. Search your library for up to two enchantment cards. Reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. So it tutors for two enchantments. For six mana, that's kind of cool. For six mana. The six mana, I think, is really what sort of hurts you here because so often you want to tutor for it and then play the thing if you can. Right. Uh, there's two tutors. Or just play something else, honestly. Right. It, it, taking your whole turn is kind of bad. I mean, what are you going to get? You're going to get doubling season mm-hmm. almost every time. Like, that's the card that you want. And then, yeah, you might want a second one. But doubling season's the card, right? So you really only need to get one card. So I would use Idyllic Tutor or Enlightened Tutor. Idyllic yeah. Tutor um, grabs an enchantment, puts it in your hand. Enlightened Tutor puts an enchantment or an artifact on top of your library, but you can play that on the end step before your turn. Either mm-hmm. one finds doubling season. That's all you care about. And they they cost three mana and one mana. Yeah. Then you can play the card in the same turn. That's very powerful. If you find that you need to get more tutors or more sort of enchantments in general you can run all three but it it depends on how good your mana is because if you're able to search them out and play them at the same time then awesome if you're finding your little choked on mana because you have too many six drops and this deck seems like it has a few six drops and there are very important six drops outside of tutors uh you might want to look at that just to make sure that you don't you and, don't, don't want to make your top end too heavy and again idyllic and enlightened tutor they're spendier so i can understand playing plea for guidance 
from a budget standpoint. Yeah. I totally get it. And it does a good approximation, but it is not as good. Yeah. All right. There's a couple extra other categories uh, that I want to talk about just Just we want to have a few cards that do a couple of things. So we want to protect our stuff. That's a, that's a category. It's called don't let everything die because of a board wipe. That's the, I mean, that's the biggest worry for token decks is like everyone takes your board away and you don't have a way to recover. Um, spawning Pit. Yeah, this is a cool one. Yeah, it's a two-drop artifact. Sacrifice a creature, put a charge counter on Spawning Pit, and you can pay one colorless to remove two charge counters from Spawning Pit. Put a 2-2 two -two colorless spawn artifact creature token onto the battlefield. So for every two creatures, you get a 2-2. Two -two. So yep. if you have two 1-1s one -ones going into this thing, you get a 2-2. Two -two. So it's two power for two power. So a lot of times if you suspect a board wipe, uh, you can just leave open enough mana. Actually, you don't have to leave them open. They board wipe. You sack all your guys, put 10 counters on this thing, and then the next turn, you pay five mana, five mana and make, two yeah. make a bunch of 2-2s. Two -twos. It's just a way to sort of like keep your value, you know, not lose all that card advantage. Yeah, it's similar to that other card we talked about earlier in the episode where you get to pay a little mana just to sack stuff. And ha having a good way to use your creatures when you know they're going to die anyway is one of the ways that you gain a lot of advantage over a board wipe because no one else is going to be necessarily prepared for this. I mean, they may be playing like some reanimation cards, but if you're able to turn 10 tokens into five two twos, that is incredibly good because sacrificing it costs nothing for you to do. Right, and it costs very little to bring them back out. It's yeah. just mana. And then... You know, again, you can do that again if somebody like the spawning pit's still there at instant speed, by the way. So you can even scare people into not attacking you because you can block them with a bunch of creatures if they don't know they're coming. You know, and anytime if you're getting attacked, you can block and then sack mm -hmm. to retain some value. This this card is very strong, and it only costs two mana, so you can get it out early and just sort of continue to increase your value throughout the game. Uh, the second card we'll talk about in this category of protecting your stuff is Rootborn Defenses. It's two and a white for an instant. It says populate, and then creatures you control are indestructible this turn. Populate just means you put a token onto the battlefield. That's a copy of a creature token you control. So you make an extra guy. That's just gravy. And then you make all your guys indestructible until end of turn. Yeah. So you sort of, this is like virtually countering a board wipe. Mm -hmm. It doesn't counter all board wipes. Toxic Deluge, yeah. notably <laughs> our number one black card, gets around this. And that's one of the reasons that it's our number one black card. But it, it, it takes care of most board wipe. Yeah, and if someone's playing a Toxic Deluge, look, everyone's creature is dying no matter what. No one else out there is going to be like, aha, I found a way to save my creatures from I mean, this. Spawning Pit. Yeah, Spawning Pit is, is a great way to do it. And yeah. it's a card that I've never seen really played that often, which is, which is surprising. Um, alternate win conditions. Sometimes attacking people won't be enough. Sometimes they just have a fog on a stick like Josh loves to have a billion fogs on sticks. Propaganda really hurts Propaganda, you. Propaganda, yeah. So yeah. you need ways to throw damage at their face that doesn't necessarily uh, use just combat damage. Goblin Bombardment is a great way to do that. Uh, it's a card that we've talked about a lot. It's one in a red. It's using your tokens as money. Uh, you can sacrifice a creature, and this enchantment does one damage to target creature or player. It's also great for just killing certain creatures. That yeah, are just like I sack th three guys and just get rid of that. Yeah, yeah, get rid of your very important thing that's kind of tearing the board apart because it's synergistic with the rest of your deck. Prophet of Crufage. Yeah, oh my gosh. Ugh, I would do that immediately. <laughs> um, yeah, Goblin Barman's a great card just because also sometimes it's like I swing at you with 50 people and it's like, and I'm going to sack all 50 after combat damage to kill you as well. Yep, so. that's the best. And then people just have their pillow fort stuff, their propagandas and whatnot. You're like, I can't attack you. Oh, it's okay. I'll just sack all my guys and do direct damage to your yeah. face. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very good. Um, the other one is Kieran Negotiations, which is we talked about, I think, in the token episode. Mm -hmm. It just gives all your guys the ability to tap and do uh, damage to target player. Yeah. So this is another way around Pillow 40 just shenanigans that people like me like to do. Everybody uh, is Tim. Yeah, exactly. So you just go, oh, I can't attack you? Yeah. They all tap and do one damage to you. How about that? What do you, what do, you do about that? Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and there's a couple of lands that you can use as well. This is a category that I think we don't talk about enough. We definitely uh, don't. This is actually really important. Yeah, I think there's this moment where you make your deck and then you add the lands and you just call it good. Mm -hmm. But most people forget this point where you're like, make everything, all my categories are right, all my cards are right, and now I'm about to make my mana base. Wait, stop right there and go, wait a minute. Are there some lands that fit into my archetype? Mm -hmm. so these are some token archetype lands that fit into the token archetype yeah city of shadows is actually from the dark so oh, guess what you, kyle you have a chance you have a chance of opening this it is a rare 
Uh, it's a land where you can tap it to exile a creature you control and put a storage counter on City of Shadows. So you can just do the instant speed. And then you can tap it at any time when it's untapped to add X to your mana pool where X is the number of storage counters on City of Shadows. So this is just something like I have an extra token or like I'm going to chump block, chump block, exile it, add a storage counter. And by the end of the game, this could be, be giving you 10, 15 mana or whatever. Think of this. Yeah, exactly. This is extremely powerful. If you've even if it's you've just done it three or four times and now that's just three or four extra mana every turn. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, very strong. Uh, the next one is Kerr Keep. Isn't Prosh he Prosh makes kobolds of Kirk? Yeah, he makes these little guys. Yeah. So this is a legendary land. You can either tap it to add one to your mana pool, or you can pay one in a red and tap it and put a zero one red cobalt creature named Kobolds of Kirkheep onto the battlefield. So he makes zero ones. Listen, this sounds like a small effect, but these are the type of effect where you're like, well, it turns on all my cards that say sacrifice a creature to do X. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if I'm just sitting there, I just need to have a guy on the battlefield to use to pay for all these other things. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's another great card that we always talk about, Croson Verge. Oh, yeah. If you're in these colors. Yeah, you should be playing this. It's just like the it's like the ulti land. Yeah, it enters the battlefield tapped. Womp womp. Just kidding. Uh, you can tap to add one color list, but you can also tap two to tap it, sacrifice it, and add, uh, search your library for a forest and a plains card and put it onto the battlefield tap. So it gets you two lands off a single land, which is insane. It also does not say basic forest and basic plains. Yeah, so you can so find your shock lands, original duels, whatever you want. Yeah, this card, if you're playing in, in white and green, then Crows and Virgin needs to be in your deck. Yeah, also Gavany Township. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you can... It's a land that adds colorless and two, a green and a white. You can tap it to play a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. It's like Micaeus. Uh, it's like uh, Cathar's Crusade. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a land that's sort of doing what Cathar's Crusade is doing on a smaller level, but it's yeah. a land. So. It's a land, yeah. You get mana off it, too. So lands, are lands I think, are one of the easiest ways to not realize that you can get a two-for-one. As in, you, it can fit into two categories, and one of them is just... It's not ramp, it's just basic... It just gets you mana. <laughs> well, what we just do, we we put a, a land in our deck that's a, it's covering the land category and it's covering the token generator category. Yep. There's a land category and token pumping category, land category and ramp category. That just covered you in now all your categories look a little bit better i mean it's just yeah. great it's great and if you think about the inner web of all your cards connecting to each other and having synergy with, with each other the more sort of ties you can throw out like a cur keep can uh, can work with astronaut's altar and yep. mentor of the meek and all these other and skull clamp so that it's tied to three different cards in your deck that I can synergize with just off the top of my head so the more you can do that the better your deck will just run because it's going to be consistent with itself you just can always do stuff yeah exactly okay so now i'm going to throw out something that's a little bit extreme you don't have to do this kyle but i would think about it extreme because what I'll, I'll explain what this allows you to do so i'm going to sort of talk about the idea of maybe changing the commander oh so we're going to stay in the same colors but maybe possibly switch your commander just something to think about so the commander i'm thinking of is gaiji honored one gaiji gaiji the honored one he's like a giant beast or is it a guy on top of that beast? I don't know. You can't really tell from the art, but it looks like it's just a beast. Uh, well, it, oh, wait. It says legendary creature beast. <laughs> so you win this. You win this one, uh -huh. Jimmy. Aha. <laughs> there can only be one. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> Yes. The Highlander movie, the first one, yeah, is the only one worth the only watching. the only one you ever watch, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's, this one's two red, green, white, so five mana. It's a beast, legendary creature, 4-4. Four, four. It says, whenever a creature attacks one of your opponents or a planeswalker an opponent controls, that creature gets plus 2, plus 0 oh until end of turn. It's a free trumpet blast for any creature that's attacking an opponent. And it does it for your opponent's creatures attacking other opponents. Oh. Uh -huh. So it encourages your opponents to attack each other because they get a little bit more power. Yeah. This definitely slants your deck to be more aggressive because you're not worried about people cracking back at you so much because they know they, they can not as effectively kill you. Right. I, and I also have this theory that Rith is probably, when you play the deck, not something that you actually use that much to make tokens. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is Gaiji, you play it, and then you attack. And it's acting like a pseudo crater hoof behemoth, but you always have access to it because it's sitting in your command zone. So yeah. one of the things we talk about is you have a lot of token generators. You don't have a lot of pumping cards because it sucks to have a ton of those in your hand and no token generators. But what mm. you can do is you can take out even more of your token pumping because you know you have this card always you have available to you. So you can just be like, I can always pump my guys because I have my commander. Yeah. So now I just need to make a lot of guys. Instead of juggling this thing where it's like, well, I want cards that make guys, but what if I don't draw the pump spell? Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, Gahiji just being that pump on a stick is really nice. Yeah, exactly. Just being able to get there too. Yeah, I like. I I mean, of course it's up to you. And the the other cool thing is you can actually just put both of these cards in the commander sleeve, and when you play the game, look at the meta and be like, I will play Rith this time, or I will play Gahiji this time, and just switch it around on your to like whenever you feel like it. <laughs> it's a very strong thing you can do. Not a lot of decks can do it, but both of these work. So you can literally look around and go, Oh, I'll switch to this guy just yeah. based on you know, what you see around the table. Yeah, which is awesome. I love it. Uh, okay, so let's talk about, we forgot to talk about this in the archetype tokens episode, um, how to beat token decks. So we wanted to cover it here because it's still relevant. Yep. So if you're playing against a token deck, here's some stuff that's really going to mess them up. We've talked about, we've, we've mentioned it already, propaganda, ghostly prison, collective restraint, all these cards that say, if they want to attack you with a creature, they have to pay mana per creature attacking yeah. you. Uh, Archangel of Tithes. Oh, yeah. It's a new card that came out that did yeah. a similar thing. There's a whole bunch in the history of Magic that just say it just taxes them if they want to attack you. Yeah. And they definitely don't want to attack you because they'd rather swing at someone else. For if, free. Yeah, for free. Yeah. Especially if they're trying to use their mana, which a token deck is trying to do. Um, board wipes, of course, are almost always a good way to deal with token decks. I think instant speed specifically, board wipes. Yeah, yeah, instant speed. Because it's also like you don't know how fast they can get out. Because it's like they could have 20 tokens to kill them all. And then on their end step, they play uh, secure, the step, waste. They play secure the waste. And then they play Crater Hoof. And it's like, oh, well, my board wipe was great. But, but it's sorcery speed and it does nothing here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and a good token deck will have the ability to make the tokens and attack with them basically at instant speed. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, also things like Elish Norn. They just sit on the table and say, well, it's negative two, negative two to all your creatures. So you can't even play tokens. They just die immediately. They die immediately, yeah. yeah. Uh, cards like Rakdos Charm, where it does one damage for each creature that the controller controls to itself. So if you have 50 creatures, you just like Rakdos Charm you and you die. You just die. That's you, the best when somebody Kiki Jikis goes infinite and yeah. says, I create 600 Pester Mites. And you go, Rakdos Charm, you take yeah. 600 damage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, um, only ever done that once, but it was awesome. Yeah, also cards like um, I think it's called Hallowed Moonlight is the one that came out recently. Cards that say when a creature would enter the battlefield without, um, essentially without being, oh, being cast. cast. Yeah, it, it it says like nope. A yep. Containment Priest is a card that does that. Oh, Containment Priest would kill against like things like Squirrel's Nest and things like that that are just yeah. creating tokens. Uh, Awakening Zone. Mm -hmm. It just sits yep. there and, be, and is like, stop it. That's stop a good one. In the battlefield. Uh, there's a card called Aether Flash, which is an enchantment that just does two damage to a creature when it enters the battlefield. Oof. So it's just like, oh, all your tokens. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. <laughs> just, just got a little Tommy gun and just like, say hello to my little friend. Well, usually when that card's out, no one plays anything. So it's just sitting there like being like, I'm ready. I'm ready to shoot anything. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like a sentinel. It's amazing how many things that just straight up kills. I mean, it, yeah, there's, when I've played it a few times, you're right. People just sit there and go, well, I can't play this, can't play that, can't play that, because it just dies. Yeah. Yeah. So they Literal just sit there everything. and hold their cards. Yeah. <laughs> So now we're going to move on to the end step, which is where we talk about something cool outside of the world of magic. Uh, this is cool, but it's also an explanation for something that's going to happen coming up on the show or for the show. So what's oh, happening is oh, <laughs> I've got a huge uh, trip coming up. I'm going to be going to Seoul, Singapore, and then I'm going to take a cruise from Singapore to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. Yeah, Josh is going to be doing a world tour, uh, signing his book and playing magic <laughs> at all these locations. I'll be doing none of those things. I'll be <laughs> reading a book and dreaming about magic. Um, Yeah, so this is a, a, a trip that's going to take me, uh, obviously, out of the country for about three weeks. So don't worry. The show is going to exist in that time period, but we're going to alter the schedule. And the, the shows may be – we've banked some episodes. Yeah. So the shows may not be about the things that are currently happening in Magic at the time because we're going to have to record them sort of now leading up to then. So this is sort of a warning that that's going to happen and, and we're probably not going to have two episodes a week during that time period. Yeah, it's going to be impossible because yeah. you're going to be out of the country. Yeah, so in late August, starting from, uh, I'm leaving on the 15th or 16th and coming back in early September. So there'll be a three-week or four-week period where we only have probably one episode per week and mm -hmm. you know you may be like why aren't you talking about the new spoilers or blah 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 well that's because we're going to record them in the next couple of weeks yeah. and we won't know about those yet it'll be interesting actually in august a lot of the battle for battle for zendikar spoilers are coming out we actually have one oh, already yeah. from the dual decks it's the oblivion sower six drop eldrazi creature uh, it's colorless five eight 
When you cast Oblivion Sower, target opponent exiles the top four cards of his or her library, then you may put any number of land cards that player owns from exile onto the battlefield under your control. So not from those specific four cards. No, if they just happen to have exiled, like with Delve or, or somebody exiled their graveyard and they yeah. had already like four or five lands out there, then you, you can play put... every single one of them. Yeah, and it's on cast. Yeah. So it's not on Enter the Battlefield. So even if they counter it, you get to do this. Yeah, there's some... Um... There's like a white enchantment that lets you exile all the cards, lands from your deck, and you can just start playing them. This guy will come in and just steal every single one of them. Pretty, it's very interesting. I think it's kind of meta dependent, but there's definitely some uses. A lot of talk on Twitter about it. People yeah. were just saying, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. A lot of cool stuff. Uh, definitely something to brew with. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so we're going to have one episode per week in the late months of August. Um, and I'm sure we'll let you all know over Twitter and stuff as well when that happens. So you won't panic. I'll be tweeting from the Far East. <laughs> Will you? Uh, I'm going to try to. You're I mean, Seoul and Singapore have yeah. tons of uh, Wi-Fi there. They're like super advanced cities. Just don't come back and like be obsessed with StarCraft and not play Magic anymore. I'm already obsessed with Star StarCraft, Jimmy. <laughs> You, by the way, you got us into the beta, but you, 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 we haven't played it yet. I've no. played it, but we haven't played it. I'm so busy. We need, yeah, you are. <laughs> You're pretty busy. I, actually, I've barely played it. Maybe in September. Yeah, there we go. Good. Good. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, make sure to check out our sister podcast, The Masters of Modern. You can find them on rocketjump.com right next to us under the podcast tab. Alex and Ben do some awesome stuff about competitive magic, about modern. Uh, their Twitter is at the MMCast. Yep, and our editor for the show is Eli Cuevas. Special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer at Living Cards MTG for doing the animations on the videos for the show. Again, all our videos are on YouTube. You can find it at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>